Hi folks, Jonathan Wilson, Toga Man Guitar Files. Today it's just sort of a V-blog rant, encouragement, all of the above. A little coffee talk. Anyway, many of you know me as the guy who builds the Toga Man Guitar Files, and I have that particular iteration for the last 20 plus years. Uh, but I go back to the early 90s, actually the 80s. I mean, going back to boarding school in the early 80s when I was doing whale sounds with my Stratocaster and, you know, uh, Mr. McFarlane, that's uh, Ron McFarlane, Seth's dad, um, told me I sounded like a cello or a cellist. And so perhaps I took all that literally and internalized it. And by the end of the 80s, well, I was pretty much... Um, I discovered the arpeggioni and I was like down that rabbit hole. And so uh, I would say about 89, that's when I kind of committed to this thing. And also, I had, and at the time, I had met a Russian luthier, a guy named George Gornitsky, um, who uh, we collaborated on the first uh, arpe electric arpeggioni. And basically, um, you know, it was from rough drawings I had at the time. And of course, his look, you know, version looked much prettier. And I wound up praying, this is actually the, uh, that's me way back in the day. So um, I've been at this for a while. Now that instrument did have like a 25 and a half inch scale. There were some things ergonomically that I was struggling with and, you know, caused some pain. But I really, um, you know, Eventually, I just decided I needed my own brain and hands to really do this. Um, and so I really distanced myself from those uh, earlier versions. And anyway, uh, this is going back to the early 2000s. Somewhere in 2001, I was sketching again and just wanting to create an instrument that was more comfortable for me. So. Basically, I came up with this thing. This is the very first Mach 1 prototype. It's been mothballed, so it doesn't have strings or it's not tuned up or anything like that. Uh, but I thought I'd bring it out for this conversation. And basically what I was after was something that had, um, well, I'm gonna go back a little bit. So in the early days, uh, I was, well, in those, Days. I was working at Castle's Music and I was setting up a viola one day and I re realized it was a smaller instrument but I could play it the way I was more comfortable with, uh, that I was accustomed with it to because the uh, earlier instrument wound up being put on a stand and I had to do a drag all this stuff to a gig and it was just no fun and I was hurting my back, I was doing all kinds of terrible things so what I was really after was what would the instrument feel like the way I love to play it I wasn't designing it for anybody else. I had nobody else in mind. Um, people's other criticisms or caveats be damned. This was just gonna be my thing. I was gonna go out and, you know, impress the world with my skills, you know. Um, but what actually happened was this wound up being the first prototype and it was designed to go on my left leg like this. So it would balance and I could kind of counterbalance it with my right leg a little bit, and I could bow it comfortably, you know, and it was, um, the other thing was it was for comfort. I was, feel, I was like, okay, what would be comfortable instead of reaching up here for the lower notes? So I, I took the scale down to uh, 21 inches, and so that's the distance between the bridge and the, and the nut point here. And what I went for was the nut being sort of eye level, and it just it harmonized with how I wanted to play it. And of course it was a solid body, meaning that I had to deal with a whole different set of problems with the pickup technology than I did with something that was semi-hollow or acoustic. Um, but the idea was that I'd be able to, you know, with these volume knobs, play trick the sound man if I was doing my looping performances in a club or a church or a coffee house or wherever the heck I was playing. And if somebody else was running the sound system and I wasn't dragging my own amp, inevitably I was better off dragging my amp around, but you know, I had to save my back up. Um, but this was working out uh, initially, and uh, it was it was closer. Um, and then in uh, the 
latter part of 2002, uh, somebody reached out, uh, Doug from Virginia, um, a guy who was a parachute instructor and um, calculus professor, and he uh, had read a blog, I guess, about me playing the earlier instrument in uh, Guitar 9, uh, I think. Uh, there was a little review of me in there, and he wondered if I built those things. And I was, uh, at the time, my father had just passed away that summer, I was kind of like burying myself in this sort of therapy of, of building these instruments. And um, I wanted to tell the story because I'm kind of going somewhere with it. <laughs> um, anyway, so this was a prototype that um, I had back then. And then um, what happened was when Doug reached out to me, I didn't, it took me a while to reach back. I was, you know, dealing with a lot at the time. And I went to Borders and you know, took a, made a website from HTML. I went to get the complete idiot's guide to HTML at Borders. Do you remember them? And um, it was dial-up days too. So, you know, I put up this website and then uh, within a couple more weeks after taking Doug's first order, which I was at the time, I was like, what the hell did I get myself into? You know, I was like, I didn't have a shop. I didn't have anything, you know. Um, I had a bastard file and a dream. How's that? So, um, Loga Torkian had reached out to me at the end of that year, 2002, and uh, said, hey, he's in LA, you know, I'd love to come by. So, um, he had his first encounters with my prototype and I wound up building him one. In fact, I still have the original neck of his. He, didn't, he wound up liking my later necks, uh, but this is the original neck and this was actually carbon fiber fingerboard on there. And you can see the curvature on these wasn't really as pronounced as they are now. In fact, now they're not even a radius, it's more of an ellipse, but more of that on another time. And by the way, so this afternoon, <laughs> we're going actually um, on site to Loga and Azam's uh, studio. There's a whole thing that, um, I mean, the, to kind of round up the backstory a little bit, uh, Loga is the one who eventually um, got out there with, in 2003 with one of these instruments and he started hitting these studios that were you know film uh, composers uh, sessions that he was doing and uh, people he didn't even know were reaching out to me and so it just sort of kicked the uh, hornet's nest if you will of interest and eventually of course as time went on uh, he introduced me to his uh, friend uh, Tyler Bates who um, had a pearl white one of these that I had built originally for um, the spec you know, on spec, I was thinking I might be able to get Joe Satriani or somebody like that on board and made a pearl white one from one that had some, uh, you know, <laughs> anyway, it's another story. But um, anyway, so we're going to go, we're doing a, a documentary called Guitar Vile, the Film Composer's Secret Weapon. The very first uh, teaser we put out has uh, Kevin Kiner on it. We did that one, I think, back in October or September or somewhere in there. Um, and we're, we've got the year, pretty, the year pretty booked up. We're going to have some other guys. Phil uh, Eisler, Ator Pereira, who Ator was in there like in 2004. Uh, so um, been sort of focusing on the Y2K uh, early adopters initially. Um, and well, let's see, we're, there's also um, there's some other ones that we've uh, been booking in there. I think Eisler, Ator. Um, and so later on this afternoon, I'm going to go see Logan. As, um, but anyway, I wanted to tell the story a little bit. So uh, this particular one is the one that kind of kicked the hornet's nest off. And the one that I said, what the hell did I get myself into? And as things got along and escalated, I didn't, you know, there was no, there was nothing, no slick factory tooled up. No, um, nothing. I had uh, uh, some friends who had a shop, a little OEM thing locally. and. Uh, eventually, um, I had them do some small runs of bodies, which I would later carve and, and finish. And this one actually had its origins there in that sense, but um, I did, you know, all the rest of it. So eventually I had to quit my day job because it was just getting too much, you know, which is a super good problem to have, right? But I got to tell you, it's a, it was a wild Bronco ride. Um, Part of what I'm talking about here today, though, is very interesting because uh, 
So for many years, I mean, we're talking lots of movies, lots of video games. You're probably hard pressed to turn on, um, you know, HBO, Netflix, Showtime, any of those, and somehow not hear one somewhere. Um, so that's 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 awesome, and everybody and all of you are awesome. Um, but this is something I've devoted my whole life to, for better or worse. I mean, it's not exactly something that's going to buy me uh, Ferraris or vineyards with a West Coast view. Um, it's not. It's very hard work. It's um, it's an expensive thing to do. Living in California, having the overhead. I started off in a garage many years ago. In fact, the first decade and a half, decade or so, was a garage business. I got zoned out because of zoning, so I wound up having to get a commercial space. And then, you know, so the garage grew into a commercial space, more expense, and I do get, you know, there are a lot of people who want my instruments, and they're going, oh, but they're too expensive. And it's like, well, they're very expensive to build. Uh, there's no cheap way to do it really well to get the high standards that I'm going for in terms of playability and sound. Now, I also get people who are like, well, why do you build on some of these older instruments? To be honest with you, these are a logistical nightmare to build these electrics. And they're just, they're, they're sort of, I like to think of this as a rocket ship, a rocket capsule. And they've sort of jettisoned the older designs over the years. What's interesting is I'm starting to see people aping my stuff. Um, a lot of, you know, some copycats out there. Mostly amateur builders, uh, or sometimes you can get, you know, low ball, low bidder Larry out there, or whoever, um, deciding, well, screw Wilson, he's, uh, you know, we'll just reverse engineer his stuff and we'll, you know, copy him and I'll give you the lower bid and since I have nothing else to build, I'll build it for you, you know. Okay, that's, that's awesome. I'm not, you know, uh, picking on anybody here. Um, but I wanted to at least give you guys a little bit of a comprehensive um, history of it. When I designed this headstock originally, it was what I call the snail box now, and I don't do these really anymore. This, of course, it didn't have the hollow out. It was sort of, I didn't, in those days, I didn't know how strong this thing was gonna be. You can see this one said, um, you know, it was Jonathan Wilson Designs. San Fernando, California, patent pending, all that fun stuff. Um, and eventually, you know, they started going whole heads and I've been noticing it's been sort of trendy having this um, headstock. Well, basically when I was doing this, I was trying to distance myself from the earlier thing that uh, you saw from that earlier 90s picture uh, with George's uh, design. And, his sort of PRSE abalone loaded headstock. Um, so I just wanted to go for something that was, you know, very distant from that. And I liked classical guitar, so I liked the ergonomics of, you know, having these three and threes, you know, for a while. Um, but what's happened is uh, I got a little, you know, annoyed making these after, you know, hundreds of them. Uh, I'm gonna say roughly, 350 of them maybe. Uh, right now, I'm, uh, well, there's actually, I don't have the exact numbers, but I know I'm right at about the 400-ish point of hand-built instruments floating around the world. 90-some um, percent of those are professional TV and media composers, so they're not exactly uh, poor rock stars out there with them. And, you know, like I said, uh, be uh, completely straight out it's not this is not like a way to get rich making hand-built instruments uh, that just you know you can't uh, it's the numbers you know are very close to break even and it's uh, it's you know people want this but it really is this and I really need this to survive so it um, it's a little too close those two little points are just a little, you know, so you want this, it really costs this, and I really need this, but it's a little like that. So, you know, for those out there who just are, hey, you know, why don't you mass produce them and all this kind of stuff, um, that's been approached several times. Um, in fact, I've been approached by uh, several named companies over the years, and 
uh, basically what's happened is they, they once they realized that you know they all everything they proposed were the same exact mistakes I made in my earlier models and the more guitar like they were they were the more they sucked and the more harder they were to build really well um, fighting frets fighting all this kind of stuff the pickup systems um, you name it so it uh, became you know they realized that it was not low-hanging fruit and it was a lot easier just to make pointy guitars that kids will buy at, uh, you know, Guitar Center or wherever um, all day long that were imports. And of course we're in a different world right now, so we'll see how that, that works out. Um, but that's been approached by a few different companies over the years. And I think at the end of the day, they just sort of like, you know, they, they saw the tooling that was gonna be involved and all the research and development. And they just said, oh, okay, well, thank you, Mr. Wilson. We, uh, we really like what you're really doing, but I think it's just gonna be too much of a thing for us to do. And the other thing is that I get compared a bit uh, to guys like Emma Chapman who did the you know famous Chapman stick where it's a tapping kind of thing in the sense of it, it's a thinking man's instrument and most people don't understand it so you know so therein lies the rub um, and somehow I'm the, like this musician artist you know human being with all those human issues that go along with it I'm not some CEO Silicon Valley crush it mofo who's just a spreadsheet spreadsheet <laughs> multiplying jockey um, you know kind of guy I'm just somebody who's just deeply obsessed with making these things sound and play as good as they possibly can and so these early models are just je they're jettisoning I mean I know that there's a fan club of these kind of instruments out there but so what I'm seeing is a lot of uh, you know people aping my stuff my um, right down to the pattern and I've got a whole gallery of this stuff in my hard drive of builders who were basically taking the pattern and trying to reverse engineer it and you know it's 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 cute and I should I'm very I'm tickled a bit about it at the same you know sometimes I'm a little annoyed when people try to make molds off stuff from my stuff and you know um, really this is something I've devoted my whole life to and it's almost like saying well I'm gonna build a house and, and I'm gonna give you the keys to the front door and hand you a ladder so you can get on the roof you know it's like all these patterns and all these little nuances have taken years and years of you know blood sweat and tears and a lot of failures lots of failures uh, to get there so it's not like I'm just gonna say oh let me just take you know 30 some years of my life the last 20 and particularly the most prolific and just say hey you know what here here's my patterns I get emails from people and I usually know what's up. Uh, what kind of, what's the radius on your uh, finger, your, your stain god? Do you sell your fingerboards? Um, I get all those things. And it's like, you know, sorry folks, I'm not in the kit business. And I'm in the business of building these instruments. Now, can a consumer, prosumer-ish, catalog-ish kind of model, you know, happen? Sure, I've been working on that for quite a while. In fact, I've been spending the last several years stormy years of um, going through various vicissitudes of you know shops um, zoning problems dealing with city halls winding up um, all kinds of yucky things different labor uh, laws and situations and then a pandemic and a far more expensive shop space and you know at the same time a lot of engineering to work out what a combo right I mean, it's a pretty cruel, the last three years have been a pretty cruel era for me to like do all the engineering when I really have to ship. And so the shipping need to ship stuff uh, has been, I tried to, what I tried to do is do all my older uh, models is sort of like a very, um, like a crossfade, like in Pro Tools, you know, where you just sort of like do this. And I tried to do that over a span of a, uh, maybe two or three years. Thing is, it's turned into seven not by any situation that I could have anticipated. So I've been working on newer models that, um, you know, are the, uh, you know, these are like a, 
carbon fiber molded unihull with a, you know, a uh, very highly engineered top. Anyway, I don't have it strung up, so we're not going to hear any playing today. Um, <laughs> you got me on a day when I don't have anything tuned up. So, uh, except for this, just for the fun of it, and I'm just going to like go off road here for a second. Um, many years ago, I just decided I was going to make myself a um, kind of a an experimental proof of concept. Uh, guitar. This was basically a dreadnought size steel string acoustic. It has that uh, headstock that so many builders seem to be enjoying these days. In 2002, you didn't see a lot of these, but I really tried to like, um, I remember when I was designing the first one, I didn't want to like totally ape Ned Steinberger's uh, stuff. And by the way, Ned and I are friendly these days. Uh, more on that another time. Um, but I really wanted, went out of my way not to, you know, do it. So I kind of had this sort of little curvy on there, and that's not, you know, like a, it's like nothing's completely ever original. But I'm seeing a lot of guitars kind of like this actually popping out there. This is one I and I call it the dreaded bastard because it's part dreadnought and part off my what I call the bastarda pattern that I've been building the uh, guitar vials off. So it's the dreaded bastard. Anyway, this is just a, a one-off. And by the way, I don't use uh, rosewood anymore. I'm allergic to the stuff. And most of my stuff has been, you know, composite. I do have a pattern here that, because uh, I've been going more of the Stouffer, you know, thing, because I got annoyed with the uh, snail boxes over the years, the uh, headstock I just had on the other one. Uh, but this is gonna be a, uh, a sort of a flamenco guitar-ish kind of thing. Now, I'm mostly pretty much specialized and known for the guitar vials, and, but you know, I'm still a guitar player. I still, you know, like to have some of that stuff. The flat, cold truth is I have so much backlog that I just don't have the time to do a lot of the stuff I really would like to do sometimes. And, you know, trying to delegate stuff out, it's not always that smooth. I find that a lot of times I delegate stuff, it winds up on my desk, winds back up, somebody screws it up, and then I've got a calendar problem where something's due and I've just gotta say, screw it, I've gotta do it myself and get it done. So, it winds up being kind of an expensive thing. It takes a while for any delegated, or any training for that matter, to, to stick. So, um, yeah, I mean, it could take a year or two just to get somebody trained up, and of course, they're going to start their own company after they're all, you know, done. Which is, by the way, that's actually, uh, it's a thing. I've had some really wonderful people. There's uh, uh, Keith Horn, who's got his wonderful line of, um, check him out on Instagram, uh, Marvin Guitars on Instagram, and uh, Jude Matthew Wright, he does his rubber tramp studio things, um, and he has some little fun little you know, bojos and violelis and things like that. So, um, really good times and uh, they're good friends. So, uh, my point is that I'm not picking on anybody out there that has been aping my stuff, but please respect that I've actually devoted an entire lifetime to this stuff. And the engineering that I put into this is pretty intense. Actually, I've got the MacGyver School of Engineering here, improvised die. So that's kind of how we roll. And by the way, anybody who's, who's trying to get into this dirty, bearded, luthier thing, um, you better have a lot of MacGyver skills. You're going to be making a lot of your own tools. Uh, some of the stuff you need doesn't really exist the way you want it to. And that's another conversation for another day. So. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, just like I said, it's it's one of those things where, you know, I would be a little more <laughs> pissed off of some big companies out there aping my stuff, um, you know, because we recognized a market for it. You know, that's, you know, code for like, yeah, we're stealing your stuff and we've, we've got the law offices of Wiener and Weiner and, you know, just prepare for a pit bull to bring you into a death rattle. <laughs> no, but actually in, in all seriousness, um, you know, I, I will take the meeting if somebody really wants to do something really big and meaningful, derivative of my work, on a big scale. 
you'd probably be a lot better off having me on board because I've got the, I've got it right here. I've got all those years. I've made the mistakes already. And so if somebody's just gonna reverse engineer off work that I've made the mistakes before off for many years, all right, have fun. And if you're a smaller builder, whatever, or, you know, mostly, you know, amateur guys going out for it, and that's, that's the, fine, okay. I mean, I'm glad to have fans, and that's, that's awesome. You guys are all awesome. Um, I'm just asking, just, just respect that. You know, it's not like I'm just going to send you fingerboards or kits or stuff. Um, it's an expensive thing to do to keep this place going, to actually live and, and get through each month, to actually, you know, make your, put gas in the car, the rest of the whole thing. So it's not like I, you know, building expensive instruments makes you wealthy. It does not. Um, unless you're, you know, you're probably a guy like PRS who's kind of, you know, mastered, you know, high level, you know, you know, manufacturing with high quality. And that's just it. I can only build so many a month where before the quality starts slipping. And I know that's the frustration of a lot of you guys waiting on my, uh, my queue. And uh, it's just the reality that I'm one person. And I'd like to be able to have a village in, in here. And that's something I'd, maybe I'd have to move to another state or I don't know. Um, you know, because things got Californicated out here. So... Um, it's very expensive and there's just a lot of hoops to jump through so I hope uh, again just hope people respect that a bit um, anyway I'm gonna continue to do this uh, I'm very honored to be of service to those who have essentially supported my lab basically that's what it is I'm not selling you a commodity I'm selling you an outcome or even providing you an outcome in exchange for you keeping my lab open because this lab is where I get all this crazy um, stuff going on and done it's a very very steep learning curve and you know it's something that I've been you know climbing for for some years and uh, there's just you know solving problems as I go along trying to make stuff that really feels incredible to play just making the nicest smoothest no speed bump you know playing experience that can possibly be done in this particular format it is a niche yes and I uh, there are people who appreciate it and, and love it and it's not for everybody um, except for those who love it and anyway um, rant over I'm gonna get on with the afternoon and go pay uh, Loga and Azam a visit. I've got Dale uh, Turner and um, uh, Terry over there also waiting. Terry's the guy who's a cinematographer and Dale is a uh, production coordinator and uh, interviewer. So um, really blessed to have those guys on board. Um, Terry's got a lot of experience as a cinematographer and TV guy. And Dale is, uh, you know, he was an, actually an editor at Guitar World magazine. Uh, for many years and he also teaches at MI and he also plays one of these things too so exciting group of people uh, to be around and um, anyway I'm excited to be of service for you you are awesome have an exceedingly awesome day stay inspired improvise or die